Good morning. Matthew, Matthew chapter 28. Starting in verse one. I'm the one who screamed out 30 years when Mitch was talking about his, if he was only 20 years younger. If he was 20 years younger, he wouldn't be able to go. I did the math. <laughs> Matthew 28, let's all stand and go through it. We're going to finish it today. I know because I was at first service. It says, now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the, door, the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He's not here, for he's risen, as he said. Come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he's risen from the dead. And indeed, he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I've told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them, saying, Rejoice. So they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brethren to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee to the mountain, which Jesus had appointed for them. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let's pray. And um, Lord, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the fact that it's something that changes us. It makes us more like you. Um, you said that we're to be people who tremble at your word. And so Lord, we just pray that you'd help us to take it seriously. Um, Lord, you have some commands in this passage and, and things that you've called us to do. And Lord, we want to be about your business and we want to be doing your business until you come back. And so, Father, I, I just pray that you'd encourage us as we're going through this last chapter of Matthew and that you bless us, Lord, with your presence. And we ask that you do this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And you can have a seat. Um, I wanted to, uh, I know we already hit on this last week, um, but there's a couple of things in this passage that I wanted to deal with before uh, we got to the end of the, of the chapter here, and they have to do with the resurrection. Um, first off, you know, there, there's a couple of resurrection stories that I really like in the Bible. I like the, I like the story with Mary in uh, John chapter 20. I think that's a really cool one because it's, it's really personal. And uh, I like the, the whole thing with Mary going and talking to Peter and John and, and the race to the tomb and the fact that John lets everybody know that he won it. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. But this one is my favorite one. And it's because of the first couple of verses here. Uh, again, verse 1, it says, Now after the Sabbath, um, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. I like that. Um, it, goes, it goes on and talks about his countenance was like lightning, clothing as white as snow, and the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. And so these guys fall over dead. I, th I think that's really cool. You know, because at the beginning of the resurrection, you know, the whole, the whole issue with the resurrection, you know, this, you know, this angel isn't letting Jesus out, right? He's not letting him out. Jesus can get out on his own. The, the reason that he's rolling back the stone is so that the women can get in. And so, uh, James and John can get in. But like, like there's this whole event that takes place when he rolls back the stone. <laughs> you know, you know, these angels were up in heaven just, you know, chomping at the bit. Remember when, when Peter whips out his sword? goes after the high priest's servant, tries to cut his head off, misses and gets his ear, that whole thing. And Jesus says, I got 12, you know, 12,000, 12 legions of angels. It's 72,000 angels. 
Um, 72,000, one angel in the Old Testament killed 185,000 Assyrians in one night. You do the math with that, it's over 7 billion, seven, it's over 7.5 billion. I did the math, you know, I, I can't remember what study, um, but not too long ago. It's over 7.5 billion people. You take, you take 72,000 angels, 185,000 guys, over twice, oh no, 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 I said seven and a half billion. It's over 13 billion. It's twice the population of the earth now. 72,000 angels could wipe out if they could only do 185,000 guys in a night. And so you can imagine the angels sitting there listening to that, going, make the call. <laughs> Let's do it. You know, that kind of thing. And so they do all this stuff to Jesus. Jesus, get, you know, he gets, he gets beaten, he gets put on the cross, they, they bury him, he's at the tomb, and this angel gets, you know, scaring the bejesus out of guard duty, <laughs> out of the guards, and that's exactly what he does. He, kind of, he comes down, he rolls away the stone, earthquake involved, that whole thing, and uh, it, just to get their attention, rolls away the stone, and then he sits on it. And just looks at him. I would have loved to have that duty as an angel. You know, uh, you know, maybe a little bit more even. You know, let, let's take him out too. But the angel comes down and does that whole thing. And uh, the Bible says that these guys shook for fear. Um, in, in the passage, in verse 4, where it says he, they shook for fear, uh, one of the things I do when I'm reading the passage is I'll go through and look at the Greek before. That word for shook there is the same, uh, has the same root word as the word earthquake. So the same earth, you know, the earthquake that was involved in rolling away the stone, these guys have an earthquake in their hearts, basically. And they're shaking for fear because of what they see. I think it's really interesting as you go through the Bible, a lot of times the uh, contrast that you have with believers and unbelievers. For believers, an earthquake that reveals the risen Lord, and for unbelievers, a quake that takes place and it's just nothing but fear in their heart. I think, I think it's, it's interesting that the same event can have such a, such a different result depending on the people the event has taken place with. And so, you know, when you, when you talk about the gospel, and the gospel is just the idea that, that Jesus comes and dies in my place, that, that Jesus takes, uh, my punishment on the cross and, um, you know, some people will look at that, you know, and because of that, we get heaven. And some people will look at that and they'll just go, freedom. And other people will look at that and they'll just go, I hate that. And sometimes people will look at that and they'll, they'll just decide that it's the worst thing going. I've always been blown away by, by the fact that God's love causes such a reaction from people who don't want to have anything to do with them. You know, I, I had a buddy of mine uh, one time, we're talking about sharing the gospel with people, and he, he said that he was sharing, uh, you know, just the story of Jesus with, with somebody, and they started getting all ticked off, getting all mad at him, and he just looked at him and said, why are you mad? This is good news. It's not bad news. The fact that God loves you and wants you to, to be in heaven, he wants to deliver you from hell and save your life forever is not bad news. But to a lot of people, that's exactly what it is. And the reason is because uh, they know what the implications are. Unbelievers are not stupid. They know what the implications are. If all this Jesus stuff is, is real, it says something about who I am and what's going to happen if I don't tow the line with God. And towing the line with God is something that people don't like to do because I want to do what I please. And I don't want anybody greater than me telling me what to do. And, you know, people have real issues with that. Um, but when you're looking at what God wants to do with you, he wants to make you part of his family. He wants to make you a child of God. He wants to make you greater than the angels. He wants to take the life that you have that's a pit. If you'll sit there and think about it for 10 seconds, he wants to take your life that's a pit and he wants to turn it into something that's just awesome. That's what God's into. And people go, no, I don't want that. You're crazy. <laughs> in any case, women come to the tomb. And in this passage, it says Mary and uh, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and they're, they're singled out in this situation. They come to the tomb expecting a dead body caked in blood and shrouded in darkness. And what ends up happening is they meet an angel. Have you ever wanted to meet an angel? 
That'd be, you know, I, I think it, I think it'd be kind of cool. I've always kind of wanted that. On the one hand, I kind of want it. And on the other hand, I kind of don't want it because every time you see, you know, guys seeing angels like these guys, these guys are guards. They're Roman guards. They're soldiers. And they're not, they're not soldiers that stand, you know, a hundred yards off, 200 yards off and shoot at somebody. They're, they're, they're soldiers that get up right in front of people, right in people's faces and stick a sword in them. These are not scared guys. And an angel appears and they fall over like they're dead. That tells me something about angels, you know, and so maybe I don't want to see an angel. Maybe if I saw an angel, I'd pee my pants. Sorry for using the P word on Sunday morning, but in any case, women come to the tomb and they meet a messenger of the Lord in an empty tomb. And that's kind of the, the message of Easter. Death couldn't hold them. These guys did their worst to them. They put a seal on the door. They put a, the, uh, a rock in front of this thing that no man could move by himself and didn't stop Jesus. There's a passage in uh, Isaiah 25 that says this, on this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day, they will say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. And that's kind of the message of Easter, you know, that this took place on what we would call Easter. Another thing that you see in the passage is that the women see him first. And last week I was, I was talking about um, women and, and the fact that a lot of times they're involved in ministry. And I think that a lot of times they get spiritual things quicker than, um, than other people do. And in this case, what happens is the women are the ones who see um, Jesus first. Um, when you get to, there's a, there's a list in 1 Corinthians 15 of people who saw the Lord. Paul's listing people. And um, he talks about the women and the fact that Mary Magdalene saw him first. That's over in John chapter 20. And it's these women. Uh, Mary Magdalene's included here, but you don't know from this story that that um, as soon as she looked and saw the, the stone rolled away from the tomb, she took off. She didn't stay. She took off. And she went to get uh, John and Peter and, and say, they, you know, the, the stone's been rolled away. We don't know where he's at, uh, that whole thing. So she doesn't get to stay with the rest of the women. And there's another uh, group of women that are, that are with these two. These are just the two that are mentioned in this passage. In any case, um, these are the ones who get to see the angel. These are the ones who get to see the Lord. And you see that. Uh, again, in verse nine, it says, as they went to tell his disciples, uh, behold, Jesus met them saying, rejoice. And so he meets these women. Um, you know why they get to see him first? Because they're there. That's the reason. It's because they're there. You want to see God work? Um, you got to be where he's working. And it's an important principle. It's an important principle as a Christian. You know, I, I think that uh, a lot of times the reason that Christians aren't seeing miracles is because they're not in the place where miracles are being done. The reason that Christians aren't seeing people saved is because they're not in the place where evangelism is happening. Um, the, the reason that they're not seeing God work in people's lives is because they're not in the place where God's working in people's lives. You know, the, the, the church is important. Jesus set it up. There's a reason that we gather together. And the reason that we gather together isn't, isn't just to hear, you know, um, stories about Jesus or go through the Bible or get more information. What we're doing is we're fellowshipping with each other. And even more importantly than that, we're fellowshipping with the Lord. And God does stuff when believers get together. We could tell that from the Bible. Matthew chapter 18 said, you got th two or three people in one place. I'll be there in the midst. He made a promise. Two or three people in one place in my name. I'll be there in the midst. You go to the book of Revelation, in Revelation chapter 1, it pictures Jesus as walking up and down in the midst of the church. You realize that when we gather together as believers, what happens is Jesus shows up. And I, I think that uh, a lot of times people are missing out on what the Lord wants to do um, because they, they kind of confine uh, the work of, of the Lord to certain periods of time 
and maybe very small periods of time in their life or in their week. And that doesn't happen with me because I have to be here. I'm the pastor. And so I'm here on Sunday morning. I get to see everything that happens on Sunday morning. And I'm here on Sunday night, and I get to see what happens then. And I'm here on Wednesday night, and I, you know, and there are other Bible studies and that kind of stuff. That's me now. It's been like that my whole walk with God. When I first got saved, I didn't, I didn't know anything about Jesus. I didn't know anything about the Bible. And I needed information. I needed to know what I was getting into. I didn't think of it as going to church because I'd gone to church with my grandma and what was happening here was something absolutely different than what happened when I went to church with my grandma. It was something different. I knew that, that Jesus was there and that God was going to do things and I needed to know something about this stuff. I didn't know anything about the Bible and I needed, I needed some help with that whole thing. And so I went to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night. I had a Bible study on Tuesday night. Uh, I went to church on Wednesday night, had another Bible study on Friday night. And I also had a Bible study on Monday night. After I got married, my wife wanted me to tone it down. And so she said, maybe we don't need to go on Wednesday night. And I said, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> She's not here, so I could say that. I didn't say that for a service. <laughs> we did have a talk about that. And I was like, no, I'm not going to do that. And the reason is because, uh, you know, I go to church on Sunday morning and I was an usher and I was a new convert counselor and there, there were things that I, w I was doing. I was listening to the study, but I wasn't tuned in on the whole thing. I had other things that had to happen. And then on Sunday night, it was the same thing. Um, Wednesday night was my night to get fed. And so I was there at, at um, harvest at Calvary Riverside every time the doors were opened. And I got to see God do all kinds of awesome things because I was there every time the doors were open. And um, other guys would complain about that stuff. Why aren't miracles happening? I'd, I'd be sitting there talking to an usher who only shows up on Sunday mornings. And he's like, well, I, you know, why aren't miracles happening like in the book of Acts? And I go, were you here last Wednesday? Do you know what happened? We prayed for this dude and he got healed. And we'd have those kind of conversations. And he was like, oh, no. Oh. And it's like, I don't know. Show up. Show up and you'll see God do things. And, you know, not just here, um, there's, there, there's stuff that you can be doing, home, home fellowships. I was always involved in a home fellowship, and that kind of stuff. Commitment to being with Jesus brings blessing. Commitment to being in the place where God has promised to work. And one of the pl places that God has promised to, to work is in the church, in the gathering of believers. He's the one who set it up. I didn't set this up. It's not, it's not organized by man. It's organized by the man. Jesus. He's the one who organizes stuff. And so, you know, when you're, when you're looking at, at God at work, I think that a lot of times the reason we don't see God working is because we're distracted by too much stuff. You into fellowship or football? You don't have an excuse. You have a DVR, right? You can watch it faster. Do you realize that if you record a football game and you just do the skip forward thing, it synchronizes with the plays. You never have to listen to an announcer for the rest of your life. Praise God. You can watch a whole football game in an hour. You know? <laughs> I drive my wife crazy when, when I do that. Zach showed me that. Fellowship or football? Seeking God or cell phones? You know? Is it about focus on faith or focus on Facebook? Instagram or inspiration? You know? Again, the Bible says that we're not to forsake the gathering of ourselves together and even the more as we see the day approaching. The day talking about the, the time when Jesus is coming back. You realize that there is radical deception that's going to be perpetrated on this planet. It's already happening right now and it's designed to keep people who are at the end of the race from finishing. And we need to be watching out for it. Uh, we need to have a commitment to be where the Lord's at work. You see these ladies, when they see the angel, um, they go out quickly, verse 8, from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. That, that really struck me, fear and great joy. You know, um, when do you have fear and great joy at the same time? And the word fear there is the word phobos in Greek. It's, it's where we get, you know, it's phobos. It means fear, just being afraid. And so I, I was sitting there thinking of things that make me afraid. And I, you know, I've, I, I've always been kind of adventurous and stuff. Actually, things that make me afraid are when people are doing freaky things. 
you know, when I, when I used to be in construction, you know, I, I walked beams and that kind of stuff. And, and I, you know, I could be way up high on a beam and it didn't really bother me. And if it's a, if it's a two by six or something like that, that's like a freeway. I learned to walk on walls on two by fours. And so it, it was never a problem. But when I saw another guy doing it, like I, I could be up on, on, on top of something that was, you know, basically that tall right there. And when I'm up on it, it's not a big deal. When I see another guy on it, that kind of freaks me out. I'm like, careful, careful. Just be careful, you know, because I don't want the guy to fall. So that kind of freaks me out. Um, but otherwise, I, I don't have a lot of things that I'm afraid of, except for, for like, you know that feeling on roller coasters? Seriously. You haven't been on a real roller coaster. Have you been to Magic Mountain? It's like crazy place. So I came from Southern California. There's a place called Magic Mountain. They have roller coasters that are just nuts. And so there's this one that's like 250 feet tall. 250, and they always take you up this roller coaster. And I know why they're doing it. You gotta, you gotta get some momentum, but they're taking you up on this thing and it's like <laughs> all the way up to the top. And then they slow down at the top as you're going over so that you can just, you can look around and be afraid. <laughs> you know? And then, and then you start going over and you're looking down and you're like, this is crazy! You know, and you're screaming. And if you're really studly, you hold your hands out because you're a man. You know? And when you get to the tunnel at the bottom, you don't do this. Just keep them out. Just keep them out. All right? And so, <laughs> fear and great joy. I like roller coasters. There's another roller coaster at Magic Mountain. We went with the, with the high school kids. And it was a cool one. It was brand new back then. It's old now. But it was brand new back, now, back then. And it was one of those hanging roller coasters. But when you started out, they put you in this contraption and you're laying down. And you would go up, you would go up to the top of this thing, and you go, you're just kind of laying down, and you got this, you know, this little thing over the top of you, and you're riding this little seat thing, and you got your hands up here, and you're going backwards up this thing. And when they got to the, you to the top, they just flipped you over. And down you went. And then they built it on the side of a hill. So when you got down and you're, you're going out around a curve and you feel, feel like it's going to throw you out, you're about 500 feet above the ground. It's like, yeah! You know? So I got a picture of me. Um, Matt actually, you know those pictures they take? I never buy those. Matt bought it. And it, it's this picture of me and I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm in a tank top and I'm all, flex. my teeth are gritted. And it's like, oh, it was really fun. It was <laughs> Fear and great joy. Marriage? Remember when you got married? Fear. <laughs> and great joy. Day I got saved? Exactly the same thing. Fear and great joy. Actually, the day I got saved is the, the you know, it's the time that I was the scaredest in my life. I've never been as afraid as the day I got saved. I've, uh, you know, like I said, I was always kind of a, I'm just not, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know what my deal is, but um, I'm just not scared of a lot of stuff. And the day I got saved, I went forward and my leg was shaking. It's the only time that my legs have ever shaken. And uh, maybe it's because I haven't been in a bad enough situation. But my right knee was shaking and I was afraid that somebody was going to see it because I couldn't stop it. And I was scared because something weird was going on. And um, it was my first encounter with God in a, in a really intense way. And again, it was at church. Jesus showed up. And um, I go forward, and I don't really know what I'm getting into. I just know that it's right and that it's real, and I need to do something about this. And I'm absolutely afraid at the time. And then afterward, great joy, great joy. They went to tell his disciples, verse 9, and Jesus met them saying, rejoice. Isn't that a fancy word? You know what it is in Greek? It's just a popular greeting. You know, and you could, you could translate it, hail, you know, something like that. But actually, it's not, a, it's not some big, fancy biblical address. It's like, hey. <laughs> I think that's hilarious. So here's what's happening. Jesus has died on the cross. The, the, the sun has stopped shining for three hours. There's been a great earthquake. The veil of the temple is torn they take him off. They put him in the, in, into the tomb. The stone gets rolled away by an angel. And the angel appears to these women, appears to, to the, to the soldiers and all of that stuff. The soldiers freak out. By the time that the women get there, they're not there anymore. And they see the angel and, and all of this stuff's happening. And they're on their way back to tell the disciples. And Jesus shows up and goes, Hey. 
<laughs> and literally, you guys, that's how it is in Greek. It's like, how's it going? Hey, hi. It's all the word means. It's just like, hi. <laughs> kind of nonchalant, you know, understated, really subtle. And then Jesus goes, don't be afraid, because these women do a leg lock on him at that point. Not only have the women seen Jesus, but there, there's some other things that are going on with this at this time. And this is one of the reasons that I wanted to go back through this. Um, it's the day of first fruits. It's the feast of first fruits. And so you'll remember that when Jesus died on the cross, it's during the Passover feast. So they have these feasts in the Old Testament, if you're not familiar with this. The Jews had these feasts in the Old Testament that they would keep, like we have feasts like Christmas or Easter or Thanksgiving, that kind of, th- that kind of stuff. And this is like their Thanksgiving. And so when Jesus um, went to the cross, he died on the same day that he ate the, the Passover because their day starts in the evening and goes to the next day. So on the same day that he was celebrating Passover is the same day that Jesus died on the cross. The next day is the first day of unleavened bread. And he's in the grave on the first day of unleavened bread. And then the next feast, that you biblical feast that you have in the Old Testament is the feast of first fruits. And it takes place the day after the Sabbath after Passover. Okay. And so what day is the Sabbath day? Saturday. And the day after Saturday is what? Sunday. And so Feast of First Fruits was on a Sunday. And here's why this is important. Uh, turn over to 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 20. Paul has talked about the resurrection in this passage. In fact, this is, this is the resurrection chapter in the Bible. You want to you wanna look at the implications of the resurrection. This is where you go. And when he's talking about the uh, the resurrection, he talks about the fact that um, the resurrection is not something that you can do away with. This isn't just a story. Jesus rose from the dead, and the reason that he rose from the dead is so that he could prove that he's the Son of God. Jesus is known to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, according to Romans chapter 1. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he's not who he said he was because he said he was going to die, and then three days later he was going to rise. And that's exactly what he did. Paul in this this chapter talks about the fact, um, because he had had Christians there there, that were questioning whether or not resurrection was real, and he's like, are you stupid? You know, and that's in the Greek. Uh, I'm just... But but he, he he just goes through and tears apart that idea. He goes, if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then what the word says is not true. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, then I'm a liar. You're calling me a liar. And if Jesus, because I saw him, and if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're all liars, not just me, but the 12. They're liars too. And if Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we're, all, we're of all men most pitiable. This is nothing but a fraud if he didn't rise from the dead. And so there are people who've looked at this chapter and realized that all of Christianity hinges on whether or not Jesus stayed dead. And if he did stay dead, then none of it's real. And you can walk out of here, it's just a game. It's, a, it's just nothing but nonsense. But if it is real, there's a, there are implications that come from that, and the implications are intense, and they're eternal. And that's the point that Paul makes in this passage. He ends it with, if in this life we uh, only we have hope in Christ, we're of all men the most pitiable. Uh, Then he says, verse 20, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. See that in verse 20? He's become the first fruits. He's referring to that feast. And Jesus is our first fruits. In verse 21, when he says, by man came death, He's talking about Adam for, you know, and he says it in verse 22, for as in Adam all die, not Eve, it's Adam. Eve is, is the one who sinned first, but Adam was the one who was accountable to God for it. And so it was Adam's deal. Even so in Christ, all shall be made alive. Later on, he makes the, he makes the issue of there, be, there was a first Adam that brought in death and, the, and the, the last Adam or the second Adam talking about Jesus is the one who brings in life. One brings in death, the other brings in life. Um, one caused all men to die. The other has a pro- gives a promise that all men are going to live forever. I'm using men in the generic. 
Um, he goes on and says, but each in his own order, verse 23, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. This was this is what happened on the Feast of First Fruits. Just a simple ceremony. Um, uh, at the time that it was done, it's in the spring, and so they had a barley harvest, and that was finished. And so they would actually go out and harvest barley. And so they would take a part of that, and they were to offer it up to the Lord. But they had other harvests that were coming up. And so there's a wheat harvest, and then there was the harvest of their uh, their crops and their, you know, their tree crops, their orchard crops. And what they do is go out and tie a little rope around a section that they're going to cut, cut and offer to the Lord, and they'd bring it in green. And they'd take it and they'd put it on the altar, they'd offer it to the Lord, they'd burn it as an offering to God. And what it was was an offering of thanksgiving for the fact that God was going to bring a bigger harvest later on than the one that they had just harvested. It's looking forward to this huge harvest. Well, in this passage, it says Jesus is the first fruits. He's the first one harvested. And there's going to be a bigger harvest that comes later on. And that bigger harvest is what we call the resurrection or the rapture of the church. It's when Jesus comes back and takes us all. And so the fact that Jesus rose from the dead is not only an implication for us as to the fact that Jesus is the real deal when he said the stuff that he said, it's also letting us know that when he said he's coming back to get us, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place, I'm going to come again and receive you to myself that where I am, you will be also. That is a promise. And the fact that he rose from the dead is the insurance of that promise. Here's another thing. Um, Jesus is not the first fruit, singular, of the resurrection. He's part of the first fruits, plural. Go back over to Matthew chapter um, 28, actually 27. And I promised that I was going to hit on this verse. And this is where I'm going to hit on it. Matthew 27, verse 51. It says, Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth quaked, and the rocks were split. This is when Jesus died. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. Fallen asleep is talking about died. Were raised, and coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. So on the day that Jesus rose from the dead, he's not the only one rising from the dead. There was a bunch of people who rose from the dead who were uh, Old Testament saints. And, and I don't know how old. I don't know if it was David and those guys or just people that people in Jerusalem knew, people who died a few months before or something. But there were people who rose from the dead and started walking around the city of Jerusalem. It's like one of those zombie movies or something. You know, it's like, ah, it's Uncle Fred. Well, they wouldn't call him Fred. They'd call him Uncle Zedekiah. You know, you know <laughs> here he is. And they're, you know, they're all freaking out. And apparently, you know, what happened is they went with the Lord. It's the first fruits of the resurrection. And so you have this whole thing going on on the day of first fruits. So Jesus fulfilled Passover. Jesus fulfilled uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Jesus fulfilled the Feast of First Fruits. Every single one of those things were fulfilled by Christ. That's cool. Then back in 28, it says, Now while they were going, verse 11, the old son of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. And when they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. How many things do you know all about that take place while you sleep? When you went to sleep last night, do you know what was taking place in your house last night? If somebody came into your house and took something away, would you know who it was? No, you were asleep, you moron. (laughs) <laughs> I'm talking to the to the guards. It's a dumb excuse. It's a stupid lie that these guys hid behind and doesn't work in, in the first place. So while believers are worshiping the risen Lord, you got the non-believers who are plotting to destroy their witness. They're scrambling to make up a story. And this, again, is the lie that these guys hide behind. Winston Churchill said this, men occasionally stumble, occasionally stumble over the truth, but most of them pick themselves up and hurry off as if nothing had happened. That's absolutely true. Stumble over the truth. And what these guys are do, doing instead of um, dealing with the implications of everything that's taken place, the chief priest put the guard there because they know that Jesus said he was going to rise from the dead. 
The reason they put the guard there is because they're Roman soldiers, and they know that Roman soldiers, you know, if you're a Roman soldier, you had the you had these um, incentives um, at your workplace to get things done. You know how that goes? You have an incentive, and you might get a bonus or or something like that. Their incentive was, "We'll kill you if you don't do it right." And so, if they fall asleep, they killed them. In fact, there was an there was an old tradition. This this thing that. Uh, the the military used to do way back when at this time. There's a passage in the book of Revelation that, that talks about not falling asleep and keeping your garments, waiting for the coming of the Lord. And it's a military term. Because if you fell asleep on watch, you had these guys around the, you know, the base or whatever, or the camp, and they were supposed to be watching, and you would have a, an officer who went around NCO or something, went around, and when they went around, they didn't go around with a flashlight, they went around with a torch. And if they found you sleeping, they didn't wake you up. They didn't scream at you. They didn't do anything to you except light your clothes on fire. And that woke you up right quick. And, you know, if it didn't kill you, it would learn you. (laughs) And you wouldn't be doing that anymore. They had harsh penalties for the stuff that these guys are saying happened. You fall asleep as a Roman soldier, they would just kill you. If you didn't get done what you were supposed to get done, Um, again, there's a reason that they picked the Romans. You didn't get done what you were supposed to get done. They would kill you. Um, If you were guarding a prisoner and the prisoner escaped, whatever was supposed to happen to the prisoner happened to you. If they were going to cut his head off, you got your head cut off. If they were going to crucify him, you got crucified. Really good incentive. That's why these guys don't go to the governor. It's why they go to the priests. Because if they go to Pilate, Pilate will kill them. Here's another thing. These guys are Roman soldiers. I already talked about this. These are guys who, uh, when they fight, they walk up to you, stick a sword in your gut, grab you by, grab you by the shoulder, grab you by the neck, and shove a sword in your gut. These guys, these are not guys who are fearful. And especially of a bunch of guys who are fishermen and sheep herders and guys like that. All the disciples. You know, these, these are guys that are just civilians. They're not afraid of these guys. And so they come up and, and try to trick them. What these guys do is just kill them. And that's not what happened. And again, what they have to do is come up with a lie to hang on to their sorry little lives. You know, it's like they're, they're stretching out their arms and trying to hold the truth at bay. There's a passage in Romans 1.18 that describes that. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. And here's the point that I want to make with that verse. God does not need me to share the gospel with you. God does not need me to share the truth with you. God's constantly sharing truth with people one-on-one personally. He lets people know who he is. He lets people know what he's like. And when that information becomes uncomfortable, what people do is they take and suppress it. The word suppress in that passage means taking it and trying to push it down. It's like it's trying to get out of something and you're pushing it back in to try to make it not so. I don't want that to be true. And again, that's what happens with lots of people when you talk about the gospel. You know, um, the gospel, the Bible says, is something that's offensive to people. And again, I, I, you know, on some levels I get it, on other levels I don't really get it. You know, when when you come up to people and you say to them, you know what, Jesus died to save you from your sins. You realize what the implications of that are? That if Jesus didn't die to save me from my sins, there's no other way that I could get my sins taken care of. And people don't like that. Because what are you saying? God has to send his son to die for me? Am I that big a crumb? Am I that rotten? Am I, am I that big a scumbag? What do you mean? I'm a good person. Why would God have to do that for me? And you know what? I understand that. I thought I was a good person before I was a Christian too. Um, in comparison with certain people. I always had a comparison. And so you can always find somebody that you're better than. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what, what, all the guys that I ever hung out with, when, when I would talk to them about sin, they go, Steve, at least I'm not a murderer. And that's my favorite answer. At least I'm not a murderer. Wow, what self-restraint. You are such a great person. You haven't gone out and killed anybody. You know, at least half the people on the planet haven't done that. Actually, it's more than that because we're still here. If half the people uh, on the planet had murdered somebody, the rest of us wouldn't be here, 
We'd, we'd be left with nothing but murderers. That's a nutso comment. At least, I, you know, I've never murdered anybody. I'm not a bad guy. And, you know, the, the reality is that the Bible talks about all our righteousness, and it says it's like filthy rags. This is one of my favorite verses, too. You know what filthy rags is? It's what women have once a month. That's what it is in Hebrew. So you come with all your great righteousness and you lay it out before God and go, God, look at all my great righteousness. Let me just lay it out before you. And it's nothing but a pile. And all the angels are going, are you kidding me? And God's going, get that out of my sight. It doesn't belong there. It belongs in one of those little cans by the side of the toilet. And that's the, that's the term that he uses for my righteousness and for your righteousness. The only righteousness that counts is the perfect righteousness that comes through Christ. Sorry, and people don't like that. It irritates them. You're saying I'm not good enough. Yeah, you're not good enough. I'm not good enough. Nobody's good enough. It's why, it's why God had to send his son to die. And here's another thing. Do you understand that when, when, you're, when, when you're looking at God up in heaven, and he's looking at everybody on the planet, and he sees a bunch of people who all their righteousness is like filthy rags. And again, get the picture in your head. All their righteousness is like filthy rags. And then he decides to sacrifice, to make the ultimate sacrifice for them. Why would he do that? And what the Bible says is because he loves you. You know what? It's not bad news that you need somebody to die for you. It's good news that the one who was able to die for you came. It's good news, not bad news. Another thing that you have with, with people when they're looking at this stuff, trying to hold the truth at bay, is they understand the implications. Because if all this Jesus stuff is real and all this stuff that, that, that those guys are talking about, the stuff that we read about in the Bible is real, non-believers know exactly what a Christian is supposed to look like. And non-believers know that they don't look like that. I remember it. I become a Christian. There's things that I can't do anymore. And it's like I, there, there are all these things that I'm going to have to give up. I'm, I'm not going to be able to have the same kind of life that I had um, before, I, before I knew the Lord. And so I'm going to have to change some things. And there are people who don't want to change it. And sometimes they don't want to change it because they love it. But to one person... They look at that and they go, oh man, if I do that, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to die. You know, everything that I am is everything that's against the Bible. Um, and other people are looking at that and they're going, freedom. I don't have to be what I am anymore. And you know what? It's absolutely true. You're going to have to give th some things up if you come to Jesus. You're going to be losing a lot. You're going to be losing a lot. You're going to be losing shame. You're going to be losing guilt. You're going to be losing anger. You're going to be um, losing that feeling the morning after thinking about the stupid things that you said and how you're going to be paying for it for at least the next week, um, sometimes the next three months, sometimes decades, that whole thing. The, the feeling where you're looking in the mirror and you got your hands on, on, the, on the, the bathroom sink just looking at yourself and going, what is wrong with you? Um, the, the feeling you had the night before when you were puking your guts up in front of people, getting it all over you and sometimes all over them. That, you'll, you'll, be, you'll be giving that up. You'll be giving it up. The situation that you have with your family and with your friends almost constantly. Do you remember the drama that you had? before you knew the Lord, you remember all that? And some of you are in the middle of the drama right now. And you're like, I guess this is life. No, it's not. No, it's not. You can have something different. But there is going to have to be changes. And you, you have that. You know, a lot of, um, when, when people look at the Bible and uh, look at the resurrection of Jesus and, and that kind of stuff, they, you know, they're, they're people... You, they'll go after the resurrection and they'll try to say that Jesus didn't really rise from the dead. We dealt with that a little bit last time, the whole um, swoon theory where Jesus didn't really die on the cross. 
you know, after they beat the snot out of him, shredded his back, stuck nails through his hands and feet, and then stuck a spear in his side and blood and water come out. They rip him off the cross. That's how you got people off crosses. You ripped them off a cross, you embalmed them, and then you stuck them in a cave. But then the coolness of the cave revived him. And when, you know, somehow the stone got rolled away, and Jesus shows up at the door of the disciples. If you saw Jesus in that kind of shape, would you A, worship him as God, or B, put him to bed? Do we really think these people are morons? You know? And uh, again, you have that whole thing. You know, guys will go through the resurrection stories, and I know that you know about the internet, and people make all kinds of hay about the resurrection stories. How many angels were there? And were they in the tomb? Or were they sitting on the rock? One gospel says two, the other says one. Which one is it? Now, last week I went to a, um, dinner with my friend Dennis Davenport. I'm saying that to you right there. I went to I went to dinner with my no you right there glasses every yeah you <laughs> went to dinner with my friend Dennis Davenport last week I'm talking to you over here glasses too. I went to to dinner with my friend. Uh, De Dennis Davenport's daughter, Janelle. I went to dinner with her. And you, I'm telling you that I went to dinner with Dennis's uh, assistant pastor. I can't remember his name, Chris or something. And you, I went to dinner with my wife. You, you four all get together, and I tell you I went to dinner at the same time, at the same place, on the same day, and you can get together and you can have a, a big old powwow about it and go, Steve's a liar. Right? Well, he told me he went with Dennis. Well, he told me he went with his. He told me he went with his wife. He told me that he, you know. And what I what happened there was I didn't tell you. I told you Dennis. I told you his wife. I told you his assistant pastor, and I told you my wife. And what I didn't tell you was that they were all there. And that's what you have in the in the Gospels. Um, all they're dealing with is the people that they talk to. In fact, in Mark's Gospel, it talks about one angel in the tomb sitting on the right. That's all it says about him, sitting on the right. Sitting on the right of what? And it would be on the right of the other angel? <laughs> Maybe, you think? And when it talks about two angels in the book of Luke, and it says, they said, do you think that they were talking in stereo? We're saying exactly the same thing at exactly the same. No, that's not what was happening. That's not how, that's not how people do stuff. Angels either, I'm just telling you. <laughs> so one angel sitting there talking, you know what the other angel's doing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What that guy said. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> and both angels are agreeing to the story, but it's one angel talking. In this situation, it talks about the angel sitting on the stone. He wasn't on the stone when the women got there. He was on the stone when the soldiers were there, looking at him. And the soldiers fall over like they're dead. And by the time the women get there, the angel, the, the soldiers aren't there anymore. And the angel's allowed to move off the stone. He's allowed to get down and go into the tomb <laughs> and wait for him. He can do that. You know, and so you go through and you look at all the, all the resurrection stories. They are easily, they are easily reconcilable. It's not a big deal. And people who go after that stuff are just silly. You know, another thing that you have with this is every one of the guys that were a witness of the resurrection died. And this is something I know about people who are dying because I've talked to lots of them. They don't hold on to lies, not lies that they know are lies. What they do is they try to get things off their chest. They confess things to you. Say, I, I've done this and I've done that. They've done it to me numerous times over the years. They never just sit there and lie to me, right? And when you look at these guys who died, Matthew, the guy who wrote this book, was thrust through with a sword in Ethiopia. Mark, next book, died in Alexandria after being drugged through the streets. Luke died crucified to an olive tree in Greece. John was boiled in oil, but he wouldn't boil, so they exiled him to Patmos. That's where he wrote the book of Revelation. God wasn't done with him yet. James, Peter, James, and John was decapitated in Jerusalem. The brother of Jesus, another James, was thrown, thrown from the top of the temple and beaten with clubs. Barth Bartholomew was skinned alive. Andrew was crucified, and he preached until he died. Jude was shot with arrows. Thomas was thrust through with a lance in India. Simon Peter was crucified up, upside down. And all they had to do was say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. 
All they had to do to get out of that was say that Jesus didn't rise from the dead. If it hadn't been true, don't you think that one of them would have bought his life for the truth? Why didn't they? And the reason they didn't is because it wasn't a lie. Their lives were changed and they were unwilling to keep their mouths shut. Unwilling to keep their mouths shut. Then you have the Great Commission. And Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. And lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. The Great Commission. Um, Two things I want to say about it. Number one, um, the Great Commission is a command. It's not the Great Suggestion. It's the Great Commission. It's the last thing that Jesus says. You know how that is when when, uh, your parents... Um, are leaving you, maybe you're older and they're leaving you for a weekend or something and dad or mom says to you the last things that they're going to say. And so I want you to let out Rufus, the dog, before you go to bed every night. And we know why that's important to dad because he doesn't want to clean up the mess because you didn't let Rufus the dog out, right? It's an important thing. Well, Jesus gives the last things that he's saying here and these things are important and it's a command. And secondly, it's given to everyone. It's not just given to the 12 apostles. At the end of this whole thing, he he says, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Are we at the end of the age yet? No, this is something that applies to us too. And so it's a commission, not just to the apostles. It's not just to the professionals. It's not the great commission that's given to Pastor Steve. It's not the great commission that's given to evangelists. It's not the great commission that's given to, you know, I don't don't know, apostles or, or whatever. It's a great commission that's given to us as disciples, as all believers. And it's something that we need to pay attention to. When was the last time you made yourself available to the Holy Spirit so that you could share the gospel with somebody? When was the last time? Think about it. You know, you're, you're not just on the planet to come here and listen to nice Bible studies and get fed, 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 fed. There's a reason that God has you here, and it's so that you'll grow and so that you'll get excited about the Lord so that you can go out and you can give to other people who are around you. You know, the Bible talks about uh, evangelism, evangelism like growing a garden. And so some people go out and plow, break up your fallow ground, it says in the Old Testament. That's the idea of hard soil. It's been sitting there for a long time and nothing can get through. You go out and you break it up. There are people who break it up, who bust people up. And then there are people who come and plant. They sow seeds. And that's valid too. You want to get a crop, you're going to have to sow some seeds. And then there are people who come along and water. And then there are people who come along and do the harvest. But every single part of that is something that's taken place so that you can get to the end of the whole thing. And the end of the whole thing is fruit. It comes from people's lives. And that's what God's looking for. That's why the church is still on the planet. Otherwise, we'd all be taken home by now. And so that's that's what God wants us to be doing. Have you sown the seed? Have you broken up any fallow ground? Not Not your own in somebody else's life. Have you watered the word of God? Have you harvested? Have you Have you been involved in that at all? Have you even made an attempt to do that? And we need to be about the Lord's business. Did you know that only 4% of believers can even define the Great Commission? 4%. This is a Barna study. They asked what the Great Commission was. Two Christians, only 4% of Christians could even define what the Great Commission was. That's pitiful. That is not where we're supposed to be. And I don't think you guys are like that. 95% of believers have never led anyone to the Lord. 95%. So there's a lot of Christians on this planet, a lot of Christians on this planet. And only 5% of the church has been actively involved in bringing people to Christ. Do you realize how many more people would know the Lord if the other 95% of people got off their duffs and did something? Do you realize how, how how radically changed our culture would be? Do you realize how radically changed the world would be? You realize how how many of the evils in the world would not be there because, you know, being a Christian is pretty simple. Don't do rotten things to other people that you wouldn't want done to you. Everything would be absolutely different. 95% of the people who say that they're believers would open up their mouths. 85% of people who come to the Lord come because a friend brought them to church or an event. 
85% of people who know Jesus come because a friend invited them, cared enough about them to say, would you, would you come with me? I want you to hear something. Would you come with me? I want you to see this thing. I've been talking to you a little bit about it. I want you to see this. And it's just, it's just a matter of, of caring about people. Jesus says, go therefore. That, that word go in Greek literally is um, a word that means having gone. It's the idea of as you are going. It's not, it's not a missionary call. There are other passages that you can use for a missionary call. Not this one. This is the idea of as you are going, as you're going to school, as you're going to Walmart, as you're going to Fred Meyer, as you're going to the river, as you're going camping this summer, as you're going on your hunting trip. A lot of downtime on a hunting trip, guys. You sit there in the quiet, in the forest, with somebody whispering, and you're talking about stuff that doesn't matter. You can, you can spend hours waiting for Bambi's mom to come so you can shoot her if you got a doe tag. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Actually, Bambi's mom was shot by a, by a guy who was out of season. Yeah, evil. Somebody should have shot him. In any case, you know, when you go to work, when you're going to go eat turkey with your family, as you're going, what you do is you make disciples of all the nations. Um, and then he says, make disciples here. And the word disciple means disciplined learner, a disciplined learner. It's the idea of somebody who has a teacher and who is willing to actually do what the teacher says. So people who are disciplined learners, that's what we're supposed to be making, people who are disciplined learners who have a teacher. I wonder who the teacher is. Who is it? Yeah, it's Jesus. Sunday school answer. It's Jesus. It's not me. And it's not you. I'm not supposed to be making disciples of myself. And I'm not supposed to be making disciples of other guys that I think are good disciple makers. I'm supposed to be making disciples of Jesus. And it's one of those things that I, that I keep in mind. Um, you know, a lot of times people want kind of authority over other people's lives. And so you have movements that come through. There was a shepherding movement. There's a G12 movement where you got a disciple who's over you and he makes all the decisions in your life or, you know, that kind of thing. Or you have a teacher who's over you and makes all these decisions in your life and that kind of stuff. It's like a pyramid type, type thing. It's just a bunch of nonsense. What I'm supposed to be doing is making disciples of Jesus and getting out of the way. There's a passage in Matthew 23, 6 through 8, where Jesus is talking about the Pharisees, and he said, they love the best place at feasts, the best seats in the synagogues, greeting in the marketplaces, and to be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ, and you are all brethren. I've had people over the years who came up to me and said, oh, I'd like you to disciple me. I've always been uncomfortable with that, because it's, you know, it's way too much focus on me. Actually, what I'm doing right now is discipling you. I'm telling you about Jesus and how to, how to get the stuff that Jesus has for you and pointing you towards Jesus. I'm doing it right now. But the whole thing where it's just me, that makes me really uncomfortable. And part of the reason for that is because, you know, you're supposed to be a disciple of Christ. I don't want you to be my disciple. I want you to be Jesus' disciple. You know, there are a lot of people who will talk about discipleship and say, well, you know, one of the reasons that guy fell away is because he wasn't discipled. You know what? I was never discipled. Nobody ever came alongside me, helped me out. I just went to church. I didn't know, I didn't know most of those people. Just went to church and found out that, that Jesus was real and I hung with him. And later on, you know, God brought some guys in my life that were a help to me, but I was never discipled. In fact, did you know that the Bible teaches that the only people that you're supposed to be discipling are people who are, dis who are committed? So there's a passage in 2 Timothy 2.2 2 that says, the things that you have heard from me among many witnesses Witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So in-depth discipleship is reserved for people who are committed. In-depth discipleship is reserved for people who can pass it on. That's what it's reserved for. Um, people will say he is not committed because he wasn't discipled. Maybe it's he wasn't discipled because he's not committed. You know, it's the committed you know, uh, it's the committed that we're to be committed to. And so when you're talking about in-depth stuff, but Jesus does say that what we're supposed to be doing is um, helping people to obey. Colossians 1.28 says, Him we proclaim, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man mature in Christ. Here's what everyone is called to. 
We help people to come to Jesus and then we get them on their feet. Every single one of us is called to this. Um, you know what new believers need? They need a friend. They need an example to show them what it means to be a believer. There's only so much that they can get from, from a pulpit or from a sermon or from a church service. They need somebody to show them how this stuff is done in the real world, how a Christian works, how a single Christian lives, what a believer does for fun, how a Christian functions. They need to see this stuff modeled. And so I know some guys who actually had some guys come alongside them and help them out. And they would ask questions, why are those people raising their hands? And they go, well, oh, it's because they're worshiping. It's okay, man. It's okay. You can, you know, don't, don't worry about that. Well, what are, you know, I don't, I don't know the stuff in the Bible. Here, I'll help you out with your Bible. You know, when I would go to church, every time I'd go to church, the guy, the guy would stand up front and he'd go, okay, Philippians chapter three. And you know what I always had to do? Go to the front, open it up like this. I start going through and I go, I don't even know. And it's all, it's all in abbreviations. X, Lev, Num, Doot, Josh, Judge, Ruth. Ruth is whole, you know, Ruth, I get that. You know, and you go through this whole thing and I don't even know if it's a, if it's a New Testament or the Old Testament. And you, usually somebody who's sitting next to me would have mercy on me and go, here, let me help you with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's what new believers need. They just need somebody to come along and, help them out with a, with a lot of this stuff. And have you ever done that? You know, you don't need to be a Bible scholar to help somebody who's a new, new believer. You just need to be a friend. Great commission is something that we're all called to. Here's another thing. We can all evangelize or we can fossilize. This is what happens with churches. You know, actually, you know what happens with churches? Churches, for the most part, are not reaching the world. For the most part, what happens in churches is you have a bunch of sheep who go ba 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 over here until they're all bored ba 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 ba, and then they go <laughs> come to another church ba 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 until they're all bored and <laughs> and what we're doing is recycling Christians, and what we're supposed to be doing is reaching the world. And one of the things that happens with churches is they you know they come up with some program or some you know new idea on how they're going to. Uh, be new and different and relevant and all that kind of stuff. And they're new and different and relevant for about three years, and then they're not anymore. And then all the, all the sheep go, blah, 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 and off someplace else. And that is not what we're called to. What we're called to is reaching people. We need to evangelize. You're going to evangelize or you're going to fossilize. And churches end up dead because there's no new life coming in them. Christians end up dead because there's no new life. They end up dead. You know more than you think you know. And part of the reason you don't think you know as much as you actually know is because you don't use it. I, I know that God's at work in my life because I open up my mouth and I start talking to people about Jesus and stuff starts coming out that's pretty good. And I'm, I'm sitting there watching it and sometimes it's in the, in the Bible studies up here and it's not in my notes. I want to take out a pen and start writing it down because I'm like, that's good. <laughs> Oh, that's really good. <laughs> right and obviously, it doesn't have anything to do with me. It has to do with the Lord. You want God to work in your life, you're going to have to step out, open your mouth, and start saying something. And he will show up. He will. He'll show up. You've been a believer for 20 years. You know, I've been a believer 20, for 20 years, but I don't know if I'm prepared for this. Seriously? Seriously? That is not how we live. Really? You know, what, what happens when you show somebody the truth when you start seeing the changes in their life, you start getting excited. I remember this one time I'm talking to this dude and I go, well, you know, the Bible says that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. So I'm quoting John 3.16 to him. He'd never heard John 3.16, you know, and he got all excited. Here's another thing. Guy came up to me this one time, different guy, comes walking up to me and goes, Steve, I've been reading my Bible this week. I'm in the Gospel of John like you told me. And I got to this passage. And he goes to John 3, 16, he opens it and he goes, look at this. This is what it says. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever, and he's saying it to me like this. And I'm like, Oh, that's awesome. I'm starting to get excited. Whoever, whoever what would believe in him? You know, it's one of those things. And it's because he'd seen it for the first time. It's like going to Disneyland with a kid. You can go to Disneyland with a kid or with an adult. You go with an adult, it's boring. 
you know, ride a couple of rides and say, like, oh, that was fake. Oh, that was a, you know, did you, did you, did you see that abominable snowman? That's so phony. He's still in the same place he's been for the last 30 years. You know, and they're saying stuff like that. You go with a kid, it's like, everything is awesome. You know, when I went to Disneyland for the very first time, day before I got witness to, and, uh, uh, my, my cousins were telling me about Jesus, one of the scariest things that ever happened to me. I don't know why I'm scared when people are talking to me about Jesus, but I'm sitting there, I'm a little kid, three years old, I'm going to go to Disneyland the next day, I'm excited, right? And they start telling me about Jesus, and they sing a song to me, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. It goes like that, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming for to carry me home. And there's a line in it that goes, Looked over Jordan, what did I see? Coming for, for to carry me home, a band of angels coming after me coming for to carry. I still have this thing in my mind where I'm going over these rolling hills and I'm running, looking over my shoulder and I see a band of angels coming after me, coming for me, for to carry me home to heaven. That means I'm going to die. I'm a three-year-old. I think I'm going to die. And all I want to do is go to Disneyland next day, right? So I go to Disneyland the next day, first time in Disneyland, get on the, on the submarine ride. And uh, back then they had little fish that, that were hanging off the bottom, hooked to the bottom with, with fishing line and uh, so that you couldn't see it, only you can see it and stuff. But three-year-olds can't see it. And so I'm in there, I'm looking out the porthole, and it's like real to me. I'm like, Mom, there's fish out there. And I'm looking through the porthole and that kind of stuff. And I just think it's absolutely real. And I can hear all the guys, and they're going, dive, dive, you know, and all this stuff's happening. And this is what really made it real to me. As we're going through, there's this point where there, there's a waterfall that comes down over the top of the of the uh, submarine, and that's when they're going, dive, dive, clang, 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 clang. And you see all the bubbles and all that kind of stuff. Well, they left the hatch open. So, you know, you know, the kid doing the ride left the hatch open. And when we went, went under the waterfall, all this water comes inside the submarine. So I know the submarine dives. It's real. You know, you go to Disneyland with little kids. And it was probably about five years later that I was on the same ride. And all of a sudden I saw the fishing line. I was like, oh, that's fake. <laughs> It's the same thing with new believers. New believers, they don't know all this stuff. And you go through and you start looking at what the Word of God has to say and telling them about it and telling them about prayer. And they're going, Jesus answered my prayer, man. This is what I was praying for. He answered my prayer. And you start getting excited. And you don't fossilize anymore. Are you fulfilling the Great Commission? Have you even tried to lead someone to the Lord? No. Liberal soul will be made fat. He who waters will be watered himself. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. It's a promise of God when you're involved in this right here. It's a promise of God. And he ends it up with, I am with you always, all the days, literally, when it says always. I'm with you all the days. Not just kind of a general always, every day I'm with you, even to the end of the age. Um. He started this thing, this whole thing off with all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And the reason that he's telling you that is because Jesus has all authority. And what he's doing is giving that power, that authority. It's literally all power in Greek has been given to me. And what he's letting you know is that what he's going to be doing is using that power in our lives to be able to implement the Great Commission. So he wants to do that with you. And he wants to do it with me. And it's, it's part of the reason that we're here. And it's the last thing that he said. It's important. So, do you want to do it? Most times when I get to the end of something like this, I'll give an invitation to unbelievers to come to Christ. And you can still do that. If you don't know Jesus, you probably came with somebody. Talk to them. They'll tell you how to come to Christ. You need him. But for the believers, do you want to be somebody who obeys the Great Commission? Yes or no? Yes. So why don't we make a commitment to do exactly that? Why don't you guys all stand, and I'm going to pray a prayer. And, and if you would like this to be happening in your life, just pray it out loud after me. Let's pray. Pray this. Lord Jesus, thank you for your love for me. Thank you that you called me into your family. Thank you that you've made me a disciple. I want to make disciples too. 
Please give me a love for the people who are around me. And help me to see the opportunities that you give for me to share your love with them. Jesus, if you open the door, I'll go through it. Please make me the man or woman of God that you want me to be. And help me to follow you with my whole heart. In Jesus' name, amen.